Okay, so what's happening, everybody? It's me, Troy, and I'm here, of course, again with the video. It's a weeknight. Uh, this is about time for me to go ahead and get me some popcorn and lay down and get ready to go to work in the morning. But I said, I want to talk to my friends out there, and I do not use that word friend, I child. Me using the word friend, I do not use that word friends frivolously at all anymore. The older you get, the less I use that term. Mm -mm. But you guys are my friends so i appreciate my book reading friends so i appreciate you guys uh, for being here and i appreciate y'all for all of the comments that you've left the likes and the views that you actually gave me on my last video as it pertains to my reading of the crime the crown crime uh companions top 100 mystery novels of all time so yeah i'm doing a, just a general midweek it's actually wednesday now check in i don't know when this video is going to load up but check in to share some of my resounding thoughts of some of the books that i presented in that video as as it accords to me leaving off on the top 100 mystery novels of all time with number 25 processing process and that's the Aquarius brain going off there so yeah I'm gonna make it quick I'm not gonna get into too much details I'd really just like to splash my thoughts here um because I like talking to you guys and then I'm gonna share some of the books that I'm hopefully going to go forward with that we kind of talked about so I did finish reading Ken Follett's The Eye of the Needle and I think this book was fabulous. It was fantastic. As I said, it has three running story threads, like an A story, a B story, a C story. But I, I think well, threads is the the better term because it's all braided together or it comes to being braided braided together. But it has to do with this German spy who, whose name is Faber, who is gathering this military intelligence to deliver to the Nazis, to deliver to Adolf Hitler in order to turn the tides of World War Two. The B story or the secondary thread has to do with these two MI agents, one being a professor who are trying to gather up as much intelligence and information that they can to stop Faber. And then the C story has to do with this woman named Lucy who is residing on this island with her husband who is par well, he's disabled from the legs. He lost his legs after a car crash that occurred after their wedding soon after their wedding and he is just brimming to the top with resentment because his accident his disability ended up ending his military the consequence was his military career so they're not in the best place but eventually all these stories converge and that is what makes up the eye of the needle um the question or the running hook is who is going to stop Faber first is it going to be the MI agents or Lucy? And of course, when you kind of throw all this little variable in as it regards to Lucy, who is so removed from this world of spies and war and espionage, she's going to be the top tender, right? Um, so, yeah, to keep my thoughts, my final resigning thoughts quick and brisk, this was a fantastic book. It was great. It was gripping. I could not put it down. Um, one of the things that... I loved so much is well in general when I read a book is that unassuming character that comes out with a lot of resourcefulness and strength by the end that most certainly is the character of Lucy now I will not say um like what is the direction she actually took or the author took in addressing um her confrontation or connection with Faber but I will say one of the things that I did leave away with the book with, and this might be telling, is that it read the third and final few chapters read like a freaking Stephen King book. It was creepy, it was dark, and it was scary, okay? And it was good. I almost want to say just a little too much over the top, just a touch, just right there, I want to say it was uh, over the top. But it was it was good. It read like a Stephen King book. So I do like if you want a spy thriller, The Eye of the Needle is a gripping one to get to. You're gonna be holding your breath, going, "How far is he gonna go? I know somebody's gonna stop Faber. Who's gonna get to him first? Or just basically how all, how all these pieces in this puzzle are gonna shape up? So The Eye of the Needle, it was a winner. I've never read anything else by Ken Follett. So The Pillars of the Earth is you know maybe 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 one day. I don't know. So after that, going in the precise order, I tried to read uh, Rumple of the Bailey by John Mortimer. And so far, I've only made it to page 20. Um, I did a little bit more research about this. And 
it has to do it's, it's, it's British and it has to do with this I think he's a judge or something a magistrate I don't know I didn't do enough good research I was looking at just look like little clips on YouTube of the TV show version and I don't know there's like this bit of overlaying or overlapping of the books and the shows I'm thoroughly confused but at the end of the day I was not exactly being warming up to this particular book um the rumple stories i think that they are a excessively poignantly particularly reading experience geared toward a specific taste <laughs> okay and unfortunately my palate is too under sophisticated or unsophisticated enough to digest this book as of right now um it may just maybe my, part of me is like maybe it's just me you know the british humor aspect i can't connect with it but i still am going to try to continue forward and one of the things i love about making videos on the internet and uploading them talking about books is i always welcome people who have read these books to please please share me a good word about them you know sometimes a lot of times i'm missing something so what is it that helped you read this book if you read it and then subsequently enjoyed it or what is it that you may not have liked and did not end up reading this book or finishing it like myself is currently experiencing right now so the rumple may just not be the it might be like a lemon that i just cannot take perhaps we'll see so after i read rumble i did finally hit my stride okay baby and i read the nine tailors by dorothy l sayers now this book oh, this is one of her peter it's not whimsy whimsy books and it has to do at the beginning of this book whimsy whimsy i still want to put that l in there my country tongue he's on his way to i think it's fall birch or something like that i don't know don't get it done we're not gonna get started i'm from america i'm from the, the deep south i don't know all this stuff i just enjoy painting these pictures in my head as I read along with the author's interpretation of these words and places or using words but he's on his way somewhere and he ends up getting caught up in a snow uh circumstance in which his tar car is, is basically decommissioned out on the road so he's gathered upon this small village in which they you know it's very much ran by a church a number of churches actually dotting the land but the subject matter of this is about bells and each bell has a different name and there are certain bell ringers and they all ring the bells in a certain rhythm and tune and cadence or what have you. Um, one example is when a person gets married within this village, there's a specific symphony of bell ringing that they endure or take on. When someone's died, they ring the bell in accordance to the age in which this person in the village died. There's a specific name for what it's called. And I'm going to see if I can find it here. Um, it's called the, 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 the Campanology. I think it's called Campanology or Bell Ringing in accordance to this book. But what happens is the, the hook is that a man is found dead inside of a grave of a wealthy woman who died within the village so there's her coffin and then there's they're digging it out to bury the husband who's recently died and as they're doing so they discover the body of another man and apparently as the story progressed this man has been bound his hands have been removed his face has been bashed in to hide his identity and that, of course, is when Peter Whimsy comes in to investigate the crime. And it's linked to a robbery. It's linked to a convict it's coming out of jail. It's linked to a number of different things. This is a Dorothy Sayers book. And baby, Dorothy Sayers delivered in this book. While it was kind of complicated keeping up with a number of different characters, um, one thing I can say is that, or two things, actually, that I can say is that you know how when you read a mystery and there's a host of different characters and each one of them is the possibility of has the possibility of being the culprit you know as i've always stated there is a secret that they're hiding there's a lie that needs to be told um to get to circumvent the investigator this book really just kind of kept on track with one particular um plot point which of course was the stolen jewels so we really didn't go around and see what was probably the motive for someone to be involved with 
the jewels as well as the man murdered found in the grave. It really didn't go around that way. It really stuck right on a singular point. But what Dorothy Sayers did in this book that begs and calls and demands the reader's attention is to pay attention to time. You have to pay attention to time in this book. <laughs> It is very, very commanding of the reader to pay attention to, to the time. That's where the majority, I found, where the majority of the clues are laid out at. And what is interesting in saying that is because when they pull the murdered victim from the grave, you know, he has no hands, his face is beating, in. They have to subsequently, of course, just figure out what's his identity, as there's a lot of twists and turns in that area. The coroner never really reveals, and it's held out throughout the entirety of the mystery, what precisely did kill this man? He wasn't hanged. He wasn't drowned. He wasn't suffocated. We do not know exactly what happened to this man throughout this entire mystery. But then at the end, it's revealed what happened to him. And what's so interesting about it for me, when I read that last few pieces and realized, oh, this is what this is how he was murdered. Girl, I got scared. Oh. I was scared. I was scared. I was like, oh my God. Yes. That would, yes, that is creepy. That is freaking creepy. And that makes sense. That is creepy. And I was, I was like, wow, wow. Because it really did kind of strike me like, oh yeah. Yeah. But see, had I been paying attention to the time, I would have got it immediately. I don't know how she did it, but it's just like it, it did never occurred to me. And it was like, damn, it was right there in front of my face. But it never occurred to me that that is how he would have. That's how he died. And I was like, yeah, because one of the main one of the characters who I can't wait. Well, he's I guess you can say as the investigative investigation goes on, he kind of sees, you know, the body before the destruction of the face. You know, he this person mentions how contorted and twisted the face was as if they were facing something so horrible that it was it was just send them to this like black void of sheer terror before they die and that locked them to this individual's face so when you take that onto the revealance of what happened to this man it's like i i would child it's good it's good it's good so dorothy l says the nine taylors was a great book it did take a little bit of concentration to read, not just simple, similar, not just simply, excuse me, to keeping up with the uh, time and the time of the book. But, you know, there's a lot of talks about bales. You have to kind of get through that. Some of the stuff I actually, uh, inscription based kind of things, I kind of just skipped like bales and their religious components and whatnot. But, um, yeah, it was still a great book. Dorothy L. Sayers be selling. She be selling. And she really, really grips you in when you read her books. So after I read uh, The Nine Tailors, and I want to read some more Dorothy L. Sayers, but they are incredibly hard to find, not only in used bookstores, but regular bookstores as well. Well, the opposite or vice versa of that. You have to order a lot of them online. So after I read Dorothy L. Sayers, The Nine Tailors, I immediately jumped into Fletch by Gregory McDonald. And this is what I picked up today. I started reading this immediately today. Look at this Golden Girls bookmark I just got. I'm always collecting bookmarks. So I'm on page 24 of Fletch. And as I kind of got around to, it's about this investigative journalist who is in the middle of trying to uncover this, I guess you can say a drug crap, uh, trafficking ring or incident taking place on this beach. But he is somehow tapped on the sh shoulder to work alongside this man who has asked him to murder him within like 10 or so days and that he's going to pay him to murder him of course there's some insurance um money that has some some ties within all that but as you can see i hadn't got far enough to get into that because as i make this video i'm deciding slowly quite quickly that i think i'm not gonna i'm gonna pass on reading fletch um the book is told probably about 80 percent through sheer just dialogue i didn't there's not enough balance to me between dialogue, you know, exposition or whatnot, whatever in between to paint, fully paint what I'm anticipating and hoping for within the story. And on top of that, because it is so dialogue heavy and only within the first 20, what did I say? 24 pages of me reading this. I think Fletch going by his voice is an absolutely reprehensible character. 
and it takes a lot to move me and I won't even say that much has, has occurred here it's just brimming at that point because I can still go forward if I choose to but I think that my decision is is that it's I don't think it's worth me specifically enduring you know what I'm saying like I, I'm not I'm not gonna really come away from this book going Whoa, wow weezers I can't you know I'm not gonna be like I doubt it I doubt that the same Peter Wimsley's voice Fletcher's I I doubt it I doubt it now the plot itself may sell me to its end like sail me like a ship but Fletcher's voice is so not pleasing to me so I might put these two on the wait list. Um, several of the books that I got on this list that I skipped, um, which is it's not a lot actually. Um, well, my ideal is that I'll put some on the back burner and maybe come back to revisit them later on down the list. So yeah, I don't know about Fletch. I invite y'all to give me a good word about it because right now me and Fletch is not getting bit by bit. Okay, I might just go watch them. I was thinking about just maybe watching the movie version and then calling it a day. Plus, and this is something that I do sometimes, like when I have really, really, really a bit trouble with a book, I peek at reviews. And there was a view, review that mentioned Fletch getting involved with a minor. So I, that's kind of a, yeah, yeah, I don't have time for all that, honestly. But yes. My reading of the Crown Crime Companion, 100 Top Mysteries of All Times, is to me is this going fairly strong. I mean, like I at least got two of them knocked out so far. Um, I was thinking about going on into Tinker Tailor Soldier, but I was speaking to someone in the comments, kind of speaking, and we got to talking about Chandler. So next, I'm going to share the Chandler books that are featured on this list that I've actually managed to gather from my library and I'm opening any and everyone to please because it's a toughie for me share with me what you thought about each of these books so that you can give me some energy to pick them up and read them so I won't skip Chandler so we'll see you in the next video right hey, uh